Gosh, it is such an honor to be among you this evening, um, not only to have the chance to be here at Denver Seminary, but the chance to be with my longtime friend and colleague, your Dr. Rick Hess, who is my walking partner at the NIV Translation Committee meeting. So an important bit of data that you might want to hang on to. So, um, we have some important things to talk about tonight. Our topic for the evening is what does the Bible have to say about environmental stewardship? Folks, this is a topic that, in my opinion, is one of the most misunderstood topics of social justice and holiness in the Christian community today. It is obviously an important topic, deeply relevant to our neighbors, both locally and globally. But as I have traveled and written and spoken on this topic for more than a decade at this point in time, um, in Christian circles, from college students to seminarians, from professors to cattle farmers, Californians to Kentuckians, I have seen that the church is largely paralyzed on this topic. So first we want to ask why. Why has the church, the historical moral compass of society, gotten so lost on this topic? Well, one reason is definitely politics, and specifically American politics. In the States, the traditional political allies of the church are not the traditional political allies of environmental concern. If you're pro-life, supposedly you cannot also be pro-environment. If you're a patriot, supposedly you cannot also be a conservationist. So if you're Christian, you can't be an environmentalist. In other words, what's happened is that environmentalism has been pigeonholed into one aspect of American politics and has been declared guilty by association. But of course, we as citizens of the kingdom of God, there's only one set of politics that the Christian should be concerned about. So we're going to do our best tonight to focus on kingdom politics as opposed to American politics. Okay, a second issue is common to many issues of social justice. We in the Western church, we have been largely sheltered from the impact of environmental degradation on the global community. We don't see how unregulated use of land and water by big business decimates the lives of the marginalized. We have not seen the sterilization of the fertile fields of Punjab India at the hands of unrestrained industrial agriculture. We've not seen the impact of untreated industrial waste and raw sewage on the Ganges River. An estuary whose future, according to the United Nations at this point, as a living system is unlikely. Wrap your brain around that. We have not seen the images of Madagascar where 90% deforestation has left the marginalized without recourse. So we struggle to understand the issue of creation care as an issue of care for the widow and the orphan. Third, and perhaps most detrimental, is the third issue. And that is the theological belief embraced by too many in the church that the created order is bound only for destruction. And therefore the assumption that it is ethically appropriate to use the earth's resources as aggressively as possible to accomplish what really matters, the conversion of souls. And as a result, the church, particularly the evangelical wing of the church, has inadvertently dismissed the issue of environmental stewardship as peripheral or even alien to the theological concerns of the Bible. So here I am as a professional exegete, didn't think you'd grow up to be that, now did you? Um, a professor of biblical studies, a theologian, to speak to this topic and to let you know that the stewarding of this planet is not alien or peripheral to the message of the gospel. Rather, our rule of faith and praxis, our Bibles, really have a great deal to say about this topic. So, turn with me on the slides to the book of Job. 
Here, God pummels a disgruntled Job with a barrage of magnificent questions, each of which announces the magisterial splendor of creation and the unrivaled sovereignty of the creator. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, Job? Tell me if you understand. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or caused the dawn to know its place? Whenever I'm feeling really grumpy about the way I think that God is running my life, I remember that question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Okay, who gave the horse's might? Who sent out the wild donkey free? Is it by your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? Folks, when I hear these questions voiced, I echo Job's response, uh, surely not I. I am incapable of such wonders. I can hardly understand these things, let alone mimic or duplicate them. Only the master of the universe can do such marvels. So I, as a daughter of Eve, respond to creation with praise for the creator. And so when I stand at the edge of the ocean and I feel its majestic power, when I am silenced by the wind, when I have the privilege of holding a wild animal in my hands, every time I find myself crying out with the psalmist, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And I'm going to guess that y'all have the same experience on a regular basis. So why? Why are our hearts moved to worship by the splendor of a sunset, by the staggering realities of life in all its complex forms? Why is it when I sit with my then seven-year-old daughter watching the March of the Penguins, am I shamed by the fact that God can instill in the heart of a penguin a level of self-sacrificial obedience that this believer can't even approach? Yeah, what, what is that? And the answer is most simply because the cosmos in all of its beauty and complexity is a reflection of the God who made it. That's Genesis 1, that's Romans 1. And the impact this creation has on us is a reflection of the fact that we are made in the image of the God who made it. So the part of us that remembers Eden, we sing right along with Chris Tomlin. Indescribable, uncontainable, you are amazing God. And when your heart pounds in your chest, that's you remembering the maker's song. So yeah, okay, I got it. The sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, we were designed to respond to creation with worship. But how do you get from indescribable to environmentalism? How do you get from splendor to stewardship? How do you get from holiness to hummus? Yeah? Hmm. Well, as with all issues of faith and praxis, we must submit this survey, this issue, to a survey of the biblical text. We must ask the question, do I see this particular value systematically represented in the text as an aspect of the character of God? Or is it limited to the marginal representation of situational ethics? Well, this evening will necessarily have to be a brief survey, but I think that even in the minutes allotted to us, we will have some time to apprehend some basic critical points and dive into some particulars as well. So let's begin at the beginning. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, and for all of you familiar with my work, you have seen this chart before. Um, here God reveals his ideal plan for his creation. And in this ideal plan, the interdependence of the cosmos is laid out within the literary framework of a perfect week. On the seventh day, God is enthroned above his creation, communicating that the perfect balance of God's ideal plan is dependent on the sovereignty of the creator. Of great significance, however, in this perfect seven-day structure is day six, on which a steward is enthroned under the creator, but over the creation. And what does the creator have to say about his steward? Then God said, let us make Adam, humanity, in our image, according to our likeness, and let 
them rule. The message, whereas the outworking of God's ideal design is dependent on the sovereignty of the creator, so too it is the privilege and the responsibility of the creator's stewards, that would be us, to facilitate this ideal plan by means of living our lives as a reflection of God's image. This was God's perfect plan. What was the role of God's human stewards in this perfect plan? Genesis 2.15 specifies, Then Yahweh Elohim took the human, took the human, and put him into the Garden of Eden to tend it, la'avda, and to guard it, la'shomra. Hmm. The message is clear. The garden belongs to Yahweh. But humanity has been given the privilege to rule and the responsibility to care for this garden under the sovereignty of their divine Lord. This is the ideal plan. A world in which Adam would succeed in constructing human civilization by directing and harnessing the amazing resources of this planet under the wise direction of their creator. Here, there would always be enough. That's a hard thought. Here, there would always be enough. Progress would not necessitate pollution. Expansion would not demand extinction. The privilege of the strong would not lead to the deprivation of the weak. And humanity would succeed in all of these goals because of the guiding wisdom of their God. But we all know the story. Humanity rejected this perfect plan. Yeah, we had a, a better plan. And because of the authority of their God-given position within the creation, humanity's choice did not simply affect humanity. <clears throat> humanity's choice cast the entire cosmos into disarray. Because of Adam, even, quote, the creation was subjected to futility, literally to frustration. That's Romans 8, 20. Unable to attain the purpose for which it was created. Doug Moo. Now, we readily recognize the impact and the results of Adam's choice in the human arena. Um, no one has to tell us that violence, poverty, greed, even unbelief are the results of Adam's choice. And we recognize our role as the redeemed community to stand in opposition to those societal norms. And we do. But rarely, it seems, do we reflect upon the impact of our rebellion on the garden. And perhaps more rarely, do we ponder how the reality of redemption in our lives must redirect our attitude toward the same. So let's press on and consider Israel, the second plan. Now, Israel is important because she stands as the first model of God's relationship with the redeemed and landed citizenry in a fallen world. So like Adam and Eve, Israel is gifted with land, a good land. And although the citizens of this kingdom of God are invited to abide upon the land with joy and productivity, their constitution and bylaws, that would be the book of Deuteronomy, makes it perfectly clear that this land will never be theirs. In fact, the regular message of the Mosaic Covenant is that the land belongs to Yahweh, just like the land belong to the creator. And if Israel fails to steward it according to his instructions, they will lose this land, which of course we all know they did. Even the produce of their land belongs to Yahweh, as is extremely evident in the laws of the first fruits, the firstborn, the tithe, the gleaning laws. In fact, based on Yahweh's ownership of the land, he commands Israel to reserve a portion of the produce of that land for the marginalized among them. Leviticus 23, 22, when you reap the harvest of the land, you shall not reap the corners of your field. The remnant of the harvest you will not gather, but you will leave what remains for the needy and the immigrant. I am Yahweh, your God. The ideological principle here is that my access to the resources of the land must be limited so that the marginalized have the access that they need as well. Now, if we had a week together, I would tell you all about the marginalized in Israel, uh, who they were, uh, why they were on the margins in the first place. We would compare their needs to uh, those of eastern Kentucky who are being driven from their land 
impoverished and poisoned by big business who's getting rich off of mountaintop removal coal mining. Or perhaps the humble citizens of Haiti. The top right image is the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And Madagascar, whose land used to look like this, but now looks like this, which can be quantified by this. These humble citizens, their lives are collapsing due to environmental abuse and deforestation. But I don't have a week to explain the marginalized of Israel, so let me say that because human sin has not changed much in the past 3,000 years, our creator made provision for the longevity of his land and the sustainability of land use, AKA agriculture for the longevity of his land and the sustainability of uh, the existence of humanity on it. In fact, he commands that the land itself be given a Sabbath rest so that the land may replenish itself. So Exodus 23, you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You're to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you're to do your work. But on the seventh, you shall cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female servant, uh, as well as the immigrants may refresh themselves. In agricultural speak, this is the practice of fallowing, leaving a field unsown for one year. That means no product for an entire growing season. Hmm. <clears throat> it also means that the microbial diversity and health of the soil is replenished and the pests that are native to whatever it is you're growing move on. Now, of course, Israel was tempted to ignore this law in the quest for personal financial security. And in fact, we have very good evidence that they did ignore this law. But the law is on the books all the same. Why is that? To communicate that in God's government, it was not okay to take from the land everything that a populace could. Rather, Israel was commanded to leave enough so that the land was able to replenish itself. Why should Israel comply? Quick answer, because I am Yahweh, says the Lord, and the land is mine, Leviticus 25. And I intend it to be as fertile for the next generation as it was for this generation. I have future generations to think about. So in Israel, economic security, economic growth, even national security, were not a viable excuse for the abuse of the land or the abuse of the poor who lived upon it. Rather, Israel was commanded to honor the resources that God had given her as his property, even when it cut into profits. And in so doing, God gives Israel his oath that he will provide for them. Now, this idea of limited productivity and limited consumption, well, it is, of course, a very un-American ideal. Now, I'm, I'm proud to be an American, and I'm grateful to be an American. But face it, folks, our societal norm is a capitalism and a consumerism that has no boundaries. We are told from the most tender of ages, through every means of communication available, that the American dream is to produce as much as we can, as often as we can, and our consumption rides just behind. We do not stop until we have squeezed every hour out of our work week, every penny out of our budgets, gotten the very best purchase for every, very best deal for every purchase. We identify our caste by our labels, be those the labels on our diplomas or the labels on our blue jeans. Yeah? We live in a scenario where excess has become the American dream. And as a result, we as a culture struggle with the sort of restraint that is commanded in Israelite law. All right, what about the creatures who Yahweh has entrusted to Adam? Well, in the elegant verse of Psalm 104, we read, he is the one who sends forth the springs into the wadis between the mountains they flow, giving drink to each of his wild creatures. 
It is Yahweh who sent out the wild donkey free and gave him the wilderness for the home. That's what we read in Job 29. It's by his understanding that the eagle nests in the high country. Folks, as any environmentalist would tell us that the single greatest cause of the extinction of animal species is the reckless destruction of their habitat, and we in America are presently devouring two million acres a year in the noble quest for urban sprawl and experiencing a species extinction rate of as much as a thousand times the historical ratio, the fact that the wild animal's habitat was designed and given to them by God should give us pause. Do we realize that two thirds of the ocean's predator fish have already been wiped out? And that only since 1970. Do we know that 73 million sharks are killed each year just for their fins? Consider Deuteronomy 22, 6 and 7. That, by the way, is Israel's national bird. It's endangered. Okay, um, a seemingly odd little law, but found right here in the Constitution and Bylaws. If you happen to come on a bird's nest along the way in any tree or in the ground, with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs. You shall not take the mother with the young. You shall certainly let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, in order that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. In other words, Israel, in like the Iron Age, is being instructed that if they killed off the wild creatures without a thought as to their ability to replenish their populations, that it would not be well with them in the land. I think the same might apply to us. And what of the domestic beast? Well, in addition to a number of wisdom sayings that demand kindness to our beasts of burden and the Sabbath ordinance that requires that the Israelite citizen honor his beast with rest, according to Deuteronomy 25.4, the Israelite shall not muzzle an ox while he threshes the grain. Well, you know this passage. You've heard Paul use it uh, as regards the appropriate support of pastors. Um, what you may not know is the role of oxen in Israel's economy. Oxen, bovines, cattle, whatever you want to call them. They were work animals in Israel. You didn't eat cattle. They were way too expensive for that. In fact, many villages actually shared one team of oxen, and they would move them around the farms until the harvest was complete. Uh, what did they share them for? the exhausting labor of plowing and harvesting fields, and then threshing the grain once it came in from the fields. Now, in Israel's world, grain, specifically wheat and barley, were the backbone of the food supply for man and beast. And as Israel's economy was a subsistence economy, meaning that everyone was just barely making it, that made the grain supply of paramount importance. Now, there's an Israeli archaeologist, his name is Baruch Rosen, who has actually quantified what just barely making it looked like in Iron Age Israel. In other words, the early monarchic period. So what he has determined is that the average Iron Age Israelite village experienced a shortfall of 15 million calories a year. Now, this makes me chuckle because can you spell OCD? I have quantified that there are 15 million calories coming short on an Israelite farm. But, but here's the point. For the typical family of five, that means that 60 days a year, they come up short on their essential food supply. Every family, every year, 60 days. That's what an anthropologist would call the hunger season. The season between when last year's harvest has run out and this year's harvest has not yet come in. And yet, in this world, Deuteronomy commands that Israelite farmer, that hungry Israelite farmer, not to muzzle his ox while he threshes the grain. 
Now, in an article I published a number of years ago, I, I worked with several experts, a couple of zooarchaeologists and then some cattle ranchers from West Texas, um, to figure out exactly how much a working bovine of historical weight might be able to consume in a day of threshing without foundering. That means getting sick. The answer was three to four kilos. That's about five to seven quarts of grain. Well, threshing took several days, so how much grain is that? 15, 20 quarts of grain. In an economy where every kilo counted, when the average family was experiencing a hunger season of 60 days, God commands this Israelite farmer to allow the beast who served them the opportunity to enjoy its life and work, even though that luxury was going to cut into the family's essential food supply. Let's pause and consider how this Deuteronomic law might reflect on the billions of animals who currently serve us in America's factory farms. Now, factory farming is the practice of raising livestock in confinement at high stocking density, where the farm operates essentially as a factory whose end product is protein units. Confined animals burn fewer calories, uh, their excrement is mass-managed or mismanaged, as many would argue, and their fertility and gestation fully controlled. As regards America's most lucrative agricultural product, pigs, uh, this confinement has been distilled into an exact science. 20 230-pound animals per 7.5-foot square pen. They're housed upon metal-graded flooring in climate control conditions, animals who are never actually exposed to the light of day. These animals are sustained in such crowded and filthy conditions that movement is difficult. Movement is difficult. Natural behaviors are impossible, and antibiotics are an essential aspect of their diet to control infection. Sows, um, whoops, sows, they, here's typically a five, 100 pound animal. They're separately housed. They live out their lives standing in seven foot by 22 inch metal gestation crates from which they are only released to give birth. The farrowing crates into which they are then transferred allow an additional 18 inches so that they can lie down to give birth. These animals are artificially inseminated to deliver an average of eight litters. Those litters are inflated beyond their natural carrying capacity by means of fertility drug. A staple of their diet is the rendered remains of piglet intestines. Feedback, they call it. Surely if God is offended at boiling a kid in its mother's milk, we should attend to the fact that dead piglet intestines are routinely ground up and a fed to sows. Guys, I would like to tell you that what I'm reporting to you is unusual. 95% of the meat that comes to you in your local grocery store comes from these farms. We should also be grieved by the vast majority of chickens in this country who spend their lives stacked one atop the next in row after row of wire cages. They live in a space that is smaller than the sheet of, of notebook paper immersed in their own feces, confined in windowless warehouses in order to produce our eggs. That's what the whole cage-free thing is about. We should care that our poultry aren't even included in the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, the law that requires an animal to be rendered insensible to pain before they're killed. But as the new agriculture reports, all of these innovations make these production units i.e. animate creatures, easier to manage, maintain, medicate, and slaughter. And the rapidly escalating market for meat for human consumption in the third world in particular is the argument that is voiced in order to maintain and expand this confinement animal husbandry. Matthew Scully wrote a book on this topic, and my dear friend Lawson Stone, seated right here, is the one who passed it on to me. He painfully illustrates in his 2002 expose of the industry, Dominion, the power of man, the suffering of animals, and the call to mercy, that this factory farm has not only taken the live out of livestock, it has taken the farmer out of farming. And even the most casual perusal of the state of the American farm confirms this. 
Did you know that according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the number of dairy farms in the United States dropped from nearly 650,000 in 1970 to 40,000 by the end of 2017? Do you want to know how many suicides of salt-of-the-earth dairymen accompanied that number? To quote Jim Goodman, a career dairyman, whose story I tell in the book, the despair is palpable. Suicide is a fact of life. We've seen a revolution in our country in the last several decades regarding the production and the consumption of meat. We eat more meat more cheaply than any other generation in history. And as a result, our country, in our country, the abuses to which domesticated animals are routinely subjected are nearly too horrific to report. And I will not show you pictures, but look at Farm Sanctuary sometime and let it break your heart. Uh, as a result, uh, I find it difficult to believe that this is what Yahweh intended for the creatures that he entrusted to Adam. It's a clear thing that our practices are a far cry from what the ancient primitive laws of Israel required. Even more telling is the complex Levitical legal structures that accompany the slaughtering of animals. It is illegal for me to show you a video of a slaughter plant in this country. It's called an ag-gag law. And I tell a story in the book of a young woman who literally was arrested for standing on the side of the road in public territory and holding up her cell phone to film the outside of a slaughter plant. Someone doesn't want you to know what I'm telling you. In Israel, uh, yes, they slaughtered their animals. And yes, they were allowed to eat the animals they raised. There are no vegans in Israel. But any slaughtered domestic animal had to be taken before the priest first. Why? According to Leviticus 17, as a sign that its life, its nefesh, had been considered. In other words, that the life of the animal was value and the life of that animal was not to be taken without thought or without mercy. The method of slaughter detailed in the Talmud, quote, demonstrates the perfection of a slaughtering technique whose purpose is to render the animal immediately unconscious with a minimum of suffering, close quote. Think about these laws in comparison to the assembly line approach that we employ in the raising, slaughtering, and mass marketing of animal flesh in America. Few of us realize that animals used in agriculture have almost no legal protection. Scully reports that whereas in 1990, the typical American slaughter plant operated at 50 kills an hour, current plants run at three to 400 an hour. How does one go about slaughtering 400, 800 pound bovines in an hour? As Martin Fuentes, an IBP worker, told the Washington Post, quote, the line is never stopped simply because an animal is still alive, close quote. Ramon Morin, whose job is to cut off the hooves of strung up cattle passing by at 309 an hour, he reports that the cattle who are supposed to be dead when they reach him are not. Quote, they blink, they make noises, the head moves, the eyes are open and still looking around. They die piece by piece, close quote. In contrast, at every juncture, Israel was constrained to consider the life of the animal that served them and whom they consumed by Levitical law. So all of these laws of the Old Testament, of land, of tree, of creature, they communicate the same idea and the same Edenic principle. The land and its creatures, they're not ours. They're his. And if they belong to God and God cares for them, he expects his people to do the same. All right, what about the New Testament? I dare to turn the slide with Craig Blomberg sitting in the room, but here I go. Let's see if anything comes flying my way. All right, there are those who would argue that there is no environmental concern to be found in the New Covenant, or worse, that the New Testament is actually opposed to the distraction of environmental concern. And you are looking at the reason why. Doesn't 2 Peter 3.10 state that the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up? Well, if the created order is bound only for destruction, 
isn't it logical to use the Earth's resources as aggressively as possible to bring as many souls into the kingdom as possible? Well, if it were true that the created order was bound only for destruction, you'd get a resounding yes from me. But a host of New Testament scholars disagree. Gunton, Beale, Witherington, Humphrey, Moo, and perhaps Blomberg, all concur that when this New Testament language is read according to its intended Old Testament lexicon, these images in Peter and Thessalonians are all standard Old Testament images of judgment. The Yom Yahweh is what we call it, judgment, not annihilation. Thus, the nature of the new earth will be one of transformation within continuity not annihilation. What sort of continuity? I have one word for you. <laughs> Resurrection. Romans 8 explains, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, i.e. frustrated, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Guys, here we see that it is not only humanity who anxiously awaits the revealing of the sons of God, but all of the created order as well. The message is that with the return of the last Adam, creation itself will finally be freed from the chaos of the first Adam's rebellion. The curse will be lifted, the cosmos liberated, and the earth healed of the effects of humanity's sin. God's ideal design for creation, as detailed in Genesis 1, will be restored. That's what we're living for. And as John the Revelator states it in Revelation chapter 21, the new heaven and the new earth is in fact this very earth healed of its scars, and washed clean of its diseases, just like the resurrected children of Adam. In other words, this planet and its creatures are not simply disposable. So let me bring this to a close. Where should we as Christians position ourselves with regard to these truths? Now, again, I realize that this message is politically loaded for uh, many of us. But just for this evening, let's put aside whether or not you have a donkey or an elephant on your car, just for a moment, and focus our attention on the politics of his kingdom. And of all of the voices, and of all of the facts that are presently calling for our allegiance in the many arenas of environmental concern, there's one voice that I'm confident that every Christian wants to hear, and that is the voice of scripture. And of all the messages regarding creation care that might be attributed to scripture, there is one that seems incontrovertible to me. And, and that is this. The garden and its creatures, they're not mine. They're not ours. They are his. And our God-ordained task before the fall was to care for this garden. And our fallen race has chosen instead to use its superior gifts to exploit and to abuse. In our greed, not our need, in our greed, we have taken what we wanted with no concern, often no thought, for the consequences that our behavior might bring. The statistics are staggering, and honestly, they're, they're hard to even engage. Countless waterways poisoned, tens of thousands of species lost, millions of acres decimated, the North Atlantic plastic patch twice the size of Texas floating off of our East Coast, and an even larger Pacific garbage trash island floating off of our West. Humanity was created to serve and to protect, and instead we've ravaged the garden. And like the results of Adam's choice in the arena of human relationships, in the arena of our relationship with creation, the results are all around us. But we know that the role of the redeemed community in this fallen world is to live our lives as an expression of that other kingdom.
to reorient our values to those of our Heavenly Father, to live our lives as Adam and Eve should have, as Jesus Christ has, to demonstrate with our lives what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we ask, what is the will of God regarding creation? And I would answer that Yahweh Elohim took the human and he put him into the Garden of Eden to tend it, la uda, and to guard it, la shamra. People ask me all the time, can a Christian be an environmentalist? Yeah. And my answer is, how could a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve, redeemed and transformed by the second Adam to live eternally in the resurrected Eden, be anything else? Thank you very much. All right, so we open this up for Q&A, and I have as much energy as you do, so let's go for it. <laughs> what type of questions do we have? Oh, and Jason is running around with a microphone for us. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I guess my question is, knowing that a lot of the environmental concerns are uh, mostly by fault of big corporations, like what can we as individuals do in the room? Like, I think one of the arguments that I hear most often is like, well, yeah, some, like you put stuff in the recycling, but only so much of it actually gets recycled or composting or eating vegan or, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. How much of like individual change can we actually make? Okay. So let me just say up front, I love this question because what you are asking me is how do I respond? What do I do? Let's see if these are in order. Yeah, they are. Okay, so, no, there it is, there it is. Okay, so the end of the book is, is an appendix which asks the question, how then should I live? And, and as you have tagged, these are systemic issues. When we talk about a systemic injustice, this is one of those issues. And it's bigger than any one of us. And I don't know about you, but I'm not the governor of any state, and I don't have a seat in Congress. If any of you do, we're talking. Okay. So, so how, you, how much power do I have over this? And so one, my first response, I've got a list of things that we can do that make a difference. Let me run through those pretty quick. Um, first of all, get educated. Usually when I give this presentation or something similar to it, people are like, there, there's... There's a trash garbage island in the Pacific. I'm like, oh yeah. And it's three times the size of Texas. People just don't know. And they, don't, they certainly don't know what's going on in industrial agriculture. And they've been told, including the farmers, that the way that we're gonna deal with uh, the needy on this planet is with industrial agriculture. When in reality, the green revolution of Norman Borlaug has created as many needy as it has fed. Okay, so what can I do? First thing, get educated. And, and with anything else in your life, uh, what do we do? We sign up for something. And I would encourage you to sign up for one of these magazines. And, and these, are, these are three groups that I have a great deal of respect for. One is standing out in the front foyer. Um, so Sierra Club is very good. Nature Conservancy, not only is it good, but I, I actually know the executive director in California. Um, Plant with Purpose. Okay, but all, yeah, woo, let's hear it. Plant with Purpose, okay. All three of these organizations are gonna send a magazine, they're gonna send emails, they're gonna link you into their blogs, and, and you're gonna learn stuff about what's going on so that you can target your response. Now, are you going to agree with everything that comes into your mailbox from the Sierra Club magazine? Heck no. Do you agree with everything in good housekeeping? I don't. Um, so, uh, no, you will not agree with everything, but you will wind up with an expanded understanding of what's going on. And one of the things that Sierra Club does uh, that I really appreciate is at the end of the magazine come voting season, they actually have a list of all the candidates and where you can find out 
what, where your candidates stand on certain issues. Now, am I going to vote their ballot straight down? Heck no. But it's really good to know who I'm voting for and, and what's in the back of their agenda. Nature Conservancy, they, they are the capitalist, capitalist response to environmental crisis. Do you know what the Nature Conservancy does? It finds really wealthy people, it gets a lot of money, and it goes and buys up all of the fragile landscapes. That's what it does. And it just buys them all. And, then, and, and they're basically hoping that maybe 25 years from now, when we get our heads screwed on straight, that we will actually help defend these properties, both under the ocean and over the ocean. Plant with Purpose is a missions organization. And let me tell you that environmental missions is growing by leaps and bounds. And people like um, Dan Neal and Danielle Carlstrom, who not only are amazing people, but they have really cute kids. Um, they're in Madagascar, and they're in Madagascar sharing the gospel in the name of Jesus while they teach the locals how to plant indigenous trees in their backyards so that they can then sell them to the UN organizations. So step number one, they're feeding their children now, right? Because they have something to sell. Step two, the indigenous plants that have been stripped from Madagascar are being replanted. And when it's replanted, then the waterways are cleaned up so the fishermen can get food again and the farmers can actually grow things. And Neil and Danielle are doing that in the name of Jesus. You know, a hundred years ago, we built hospitals and orphanages when we went overseas. Now, we're planting trees. It's pretty cool. Okay, um, get going. Um, start where you are is my first response. And I, I was just at BioLogos, I don't know, six months ago, and someone was saying to me, well, you know, if Jesus comes back in two weeks, why should I care about environmental concern? And I had to ponder this question for a moment, and what I wound up saying was, you're thinking about this wrong. <laughs> because if Jesus is coming back in two weeks, are you going to stop having devotions? If Jesus comes back in two weeks, are you going to stop sponsoring your compassion child? Probably not. Because your devotions and your sponsorship of that compassion child are an expression of sanctification. You are being conformed into the image of the sun. That's why you do these things. Are you going to save every orphan on this planet? No. Are you gonna rescue every young woman out of sex trafficking? No. Are we gonna stop every war? No. Does that change the fact that we are responsible to go down swinging for the kingdom? Heck no. Start swinging. Okay, so um, start where you are. And when you start where you are, then I wanna recognize, um, I want to encourage you to get your hands on this book, Go Green, Save Green. Um, that one is by Nancy Sleeth. And it's a super practical book that says, this is what your water heater looks like. Here is the knob on your water heater that controls the temperature. Don't bark your knuckles on the third screw to the left. Turn it here and you will save this much energy. It's very, very helpful. Um, other thing I would tell you, there are two big issues right now. Plastic and petroleum. These are the two biggies. If you can control your use of plastic and petroleum, you are making a difference. Um, vote with your checkbook. You know, thank God for capitalism. You can change what winds up on the grocery store shelf by what you buy. And we've done this dozens of times. Do we remember dolphin safe tuna? Do you remember that? We changed the fishing industry because we stopped buying tuna that didn't have the dolphin safe tuna mark on it. When you go to buy meat, there is a new stamp that's called Humanely Raised. It's very small, and it's very hard to find, and my husband is scared to go grocery shopping at this point in time because of whatever he brings home. Um, <laughs> vote with your checkbook. And then the last thing, live with restraint. Um, a couple more details, just stats here. No, we'll get past that one. Textile waste, it is up 811% since 1960. Hey, it's cool to go thrifting. Go thrifting. Stop buying all that new stuff. Um, those are just a bunch of stats up there. Um, World War II, uh, we were recycling and reusing about 25% of our waste because we had to. Um, 1960, that was 7%. 1990, that was 17. 2022, we're up to 30. We can campaign for these things. We can argue for these things. In our office buildings, in our homes, in our schools, hey, why are there no recycling bins in my church? Because I can guarantee you there probably aren't. Um, yeah, so very long answer. 
Thank you for asking the question. Next question. <laughs> Right here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I do, I do. And part of me, part of me, uh, there's, a, there's a quote in this book about a fellow who was a career environmentalist and he wound up in a massive depression and um, because he had spent his life on this topic and no one was listening, right? Um, and he actually came out of the depression with do what I can, do what I can, which honestly is how salt and light affects this planet. Yeah, we do what we can. Um, do I have hope? Yes, I have hope. Do I think we can actually fix this? No, I don't. Is that a horrible thing to say? I, I, Jesus has got to come back. Yeah? The fabric is stained. The, the garment is torn. The water is poisoned. Um, and I don't mean those as environmental statements. I mean them as metaphors. But that doesn't change my responsibility to stand boldly with the opposition. And Every orphan we rescue, every teenage girl we get out of sex trafficking, every time we dial this back, we have demonstrated Christ to the world. And, and, and can I tag on to that? The fact that the church has not embraced this topic is not speaking good things to our neighbors, either locally or globally. On the church side of things, um, you talked briefly, and I haven't read your book yet, but um, okay. you talked briefly about just consumption yeah, and how really like you can buy a Prius and do all this right stuff, but mm -hmm. if you don't, if you still over consume, it's still not good. How can we, so I guess that piece, like the teaching people about how to, or about plastics, that was a big mm -hmm. one, which you barely touched, but that's a huge one. Um, how can we help our churches other than just from the pulpit to educate our our congregants and stuff in the uh, the biblical stance of, of consumption right. and also just on our eschatology because it's true i think i mean i even had an old church leader who used to mm -hmm. say uh you know stba scheduled to burn anyway so who <laughs> cares i have never heard that before say yeah, it again stba scheduled to burn anyways craig do you have that one yeah. <laughs> so and I, there is a lot of there is a lot of um, churches that I think do have that eschatology, and if you do, yeah, I mean, then do. who cares, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a big factor that probably is underlying a lot of this and mm -hmm. why it's so polarized. Mm -hmm. So how can we do it other than just from the pulpit help our churches, or what maybe okay. are you doing in your church? Yeah. So I'm going to hook a few of these, and you remind me if I forgot one. The S B T A, S T B A. It's scheduled to burn anyway. Well. Honestly, it's, it's, it's an in-your-face conversation, so I would never have it with a large crowd. But uh, a lot of orphans are STBA as well. A lot of widows are STBA. Is that how we treat our unsaved neighbors? They're scheduled to burn, so we just treat them as disposable quantities? Where is the posture of Christ in there? So that would be one challenge I would throw in there. Um, as for your church, there actually are curriculums out there. I'm, Rick and I were just talking about this. I'm trying to talk seminary now, IVP, into letting me create one as well. Um, I think there are some very um, excellent and standard uh, steps that a church can move forward on. First thing is that people have to get aware. And, and can I point out as well, there's a lot of crazy out there in the environmental advocacy realm. There's a lot of pantheism out there. There's biotic rights that, you know, the, the potato bug in my back garden has as much right to be alive as I do. Um, and I have technical articles on that. But So there is a lot of crazy out there. We, we want to be motivating our churches based on their theology. I mean, honestly, it's a lot like the race conversation at this point in time. We, the New Testament church, have had the answer to 
systemic racial injustice since the first time Paul opened his mouth in the book of Galatians, but we ignored it and we are now paying the price. Um, so there is a theological answer. So that would be, I want the church to focus on what their Bible has to teach them. Um, studies like this are pretty easy to do as a book club. Really what you need to do is you need to get about seven people excited, yeah? And then it starts spreading. The next thing you need to do is you need to sit down with your pastoral leadership and ask if you can put a little green committee together. And the green committee needs to be full of energy and, and ready to rock. Um, they need to do an energy audit. You need to look at the church landscaping. What are you planting out there? Are you planting natives? Or are you planting stuff that's sucking all the water out of Southern California and is an invasive species anyway? Um, church facilities are huge. We use a lot of energy. And honestly, try to find a recycle bin in your standard 10,000 member church. I, I challenge you to find one. So your green committee, energy audit, take a look at the landscaping, organize a recycling program, um, address energy use. The coffee hour is a big one. Um, these things can happen. And, and it takes that squad of um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead probably didn't say that, but everybody thinks she did. So I'm just going to leave it up there. Um, okay. So these are all things that can do, but I want to encourage you. Um, you're not, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, we don't transform our lives as Christians overnight. You know, I didn't go from being a scruffy sour-mouthed 15-year-old to like a fairly respectable Christian overnight. This is a sanctification process. We start small, but we keep going in that direction. Um, yeah, but I would encourage you toward Matthew Sleeth, um, Serve God, Save the Planet. He's got a curriculum for churches. Um, my to-do list in here will help. Uh, but, but thinking about our church facilities as massive facilities that make use of a lot of energy. One of the things they just did at my daughter's high schools in SoCal, Southern California, which, you know, they all like to say they're all very environmental, but try to find a recycling bin. Um, but one of the things we did is uh, we've covered our parking lots with structures that are necessary to protect cars. And every one of them has a solar panel on it. Um, how much fun is that? So... Did I? Okay, thanks. Have I exhausted you yet? Do we have any others? Aylin. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I'm trying to reconcile many times in my mind, you know, the popular climate change or mm. that keeps changing name and, and the biblical view that you're presenting. Mm -hmm. And one seems to be so politicized. Mm. And so I don't even know how how real the movement is because of the politics of it. Can you help us? Uh, yeah, understand? no, and that's a very real problem. And I, it's, it's almost as though we're, we're standing and everyone's yelling at us, and which, which is true. And that's one of the reasons I, I make that statement in the lecture, that there's one thing I know is true. This stuff is not mine, and, and I'm responsible for it, so what am I gonna do? And, and in my life, I literally start with my own backyard, right? And, and that is a step toward kingdom living. Um, so when it comes to climate change, uh, Matthew Sleeth, for example, who's been in, in this game longer than I have, he won't talk about climate change because he knows if he steps into certain communities and he names climate change, they stop listening. And reality is all of the solutions that we've already talked about, all of the acts of obedience that we're, we've we're talking about, if we actually moved into those spaces where we were careful about plastic and petroleum and were lived with restraint, um, that would undo climate change. Because um, the solutions to climate change are all the things that I've been showing you on these slides. Uh, it's just, again, we've pushed it so far that we're in crisis. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is my favorite person on this topic. Um, Catherine is a believer. Um, Catherine is... Uh, an outspoken believer. She also manages to tell you that the world is ending with the most charming smile. Um, and, and she's a true climate scientist. She's, she's got the data. 
And she, as well, but primarily she has convinced me this is, this is a very, very real issue. Now, you know, if your politics still keep you over here, that, that doesn't stop us responding to the petroleum and the plastic need and addressing the way we're abusing our very abundant land in the United States. And for those in Europe, by the way, they have a whole different set of laws about lots of this stuff because they have much more limited space. And they've already come to the end of their space. And so they've had to start dialing back. Is that helpful? OK. Yeah, it's late. You're tired. Does anyone have an aha moment or something that has just been really important to them about not just tonight, but this whole larger discussion? I'm, I would love to give you a chance to share that. Right here. Oh, can I stand? Okay. Um, I just heard, it was uh, on NPR, and, and I don't remember the exact quote, but it was like, if every American would stop eating meat, if there was one day a week, mm. and it was about the water crisis in the Colorado River mm. and everything drying up that, and I don't, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was a phenomenal amount of water that's wasted just from the, from how much meat we eat. Mm -hmm. And so that's just been a thing I'm, I've been thinking a lot about. Mm. You know, thank you for sharing that. And if you, if someone else has got a comment, I'm eager to hear it. I would love for my comments to end with you guys with a particular quote. And um, it's at the end of the book, it starts the conclusion, and it comes from a fellow named Gus Speth. And Gus Speth was the chairman of the Council on Environmental Quality under President Jimmy Carter. That's how far back he goes. He has launched several environmental organizations himself. He has worked with the EPA um, left and right. The man's a complete insider. That's my point. Complete insider and every much, every inch a hard scientist. Like I'm a theologian, right? This guy's a hard scientist. And this is what he had to say when interviewed just a, a few years back. He said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. This is not a Christian talking to us. We need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists, we don't know how to do that. And I, yeah, I read a quote like that and I say, I know some people who know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I do. And honestly, I, I've got two big goals in my work. One is those undergraduates who sit in front of me who are convinced that their, their evangelical faith has failed them and they need to go somewhere else. I want them to know that maybe their, maybe their church has failed them, but their faith has not. That is one major issue for me. And the other thing, I want to awaken the sleeping giant. That's what I want to do. And we, the church, we are a giant. When we put our minds behind things, we have hospitals popping up all over this planet. When we decide that, that orphan, the orphan situation is no longer tolerable, we pack up our lives and we do something about it. And I believe that if we decided that this is no longer tolerable and the sleeping giant awakened, oh, what we could do. So thank you so much for this evening. Thank you. Thank you.